President Jaeger and myself, we are very happy to be here today in Brussels for what is an absolute primeur in the history of the cult that we come to Brussels to present our annual report 2016 and that we also want to engage in a discussion with you on questions about the court and its functioning, which you might have. You know, we can't speak about pending cases, and the deliberations of the court are secret. The rest is transparent and ought to be. Justice must be seen to be done, and the ways the court is working are extremely important that they be understood by the outside world. You know that the Court of Justice of the European Union is one of the four main institutions of the Union, next to the Council, including, that is, the European Council, the Commission and the Parliament. It's what Pierre Pescator has once called le quadripartisme institutionnel. Uh, it means that the Court is a self-governing institution. We have no national council or the judiciary or EU council of the judiciary nor an EU ministry of justice organizing the judicial branch like it is mostly the case in the um, uh, member states and in third states around the world. It's in that sense a responsibility of self-governance uh, and uh, we try to do that as best as we can. And indeed, in the document cited by our Director of Communications, you will read uh, all that you can want to know. And the documents are here outside the room. Um, and you can ask many questions on that, and we will be available for you. But of course, the main task of the court, fortunately enough, is to say the law, like Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court said in his famous Marbury versus Madison, uh, opinion 1803, it is emphatically the province uh, of the court to say what the law is. Well, it is emphatically the province of the Court of Justice of the European Union to say what union law is. And that process takes place mainly and essentially in interaction with the national courts. The Court of Justice of the European Union and in particular the Court of Justice as the upper court, is to be seen properly as part of a network. It's the spin in a network with all the national judiciaries. And it is interacting and relating with the national courts. You should know that we received last year 470 references for preliminary rulings. And this in all areas of European Union law. And here, excuse me, I'm a professor, so if I'm a little bit uh, too explanatory, then uh, that is due to that. So here we see that the Court of Justice is really um, developing with the European Union itself. In the first 30 years of the um, European Union integration, the court was basically a common market court. It was dealing with um, free movement of goods, persons understood as wage workers or self-employed persons, services and capital, competition, a little bit of state aid, a bit of agriculture and, and transport policy. And that was it. And that was so for 30 years, between 1957 and 1987, the Single European Act. Thereafter, every five years, you had a deepening of the integration process. Maastricht, 92, with the internal market, which is not just a change of an adjective. The difference between the internal market and the common market is that the internal market is establishing an area without internal frontiers. It is wiping out the crossing of internal frontiers as a relevant legal factor for controls on persons, goods, services, etc. Internal market, citizenship of the Union, 
Economic and Monetary Union. Single currency. It's all Maastricht. Five years later. Amsterdam. Area of Freedom, Security and Justice. Judicial cooperation in civil matters. It's like the Dutch say, a whole mouthful of words, but what does it mean? It means contracts, torts, family law. All these subjects of classical national law have cross-border connection points because of the movement of persons and of commercial transactions. Which national court is competent to deal with litigation? What is the applicable law? Under which conditions will there be recognition and enforcement of judgments of one member state in another member state? Same thing in criminal law. European arrest warrant. It's a court of one member state surrendering a person convicted in another member state, hence recognizing that judgment in terms of enforcing it. And I can go on like this. Asylum and immigration law, when you have a common area without internal frontiers, external borders become of common interest. You're in in the area, you're in anywhere. Then you have NIS with the enlargement of qualified majority voting and the consolidation of the structures of the present union in Lisbon, with the, especially the binding character of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. I recall quickly that development so as to make clear in the year that we celebrate the 60 years of the Treaty of Rome that in fact these 60 years is two times 30 years, not just arithmetically, which is quite obvious, but substantively. And the case law of our court and its substantive development has followed the same pace we are now dealing with all the subjects which are relevant for the citizens across the board. What about religious symbols in the workplace? What about measures combating terrorism and the surveillance by police and other authorities that they might imply and whether they are or not compatible with the privacy rights and the protection of personal data? The internet being, of course, a cross-border service and hence regulated by EU law. So we are dragged in all the same subjects of a high sensitivity. You could say that in the first 30 years, the court was operating in what political scientists call an area of low politics, common market, who could be against it, increasing welfare. The second 30 years, the court moves with the whole of the union in high politics, fireworks, but it remains a court. It is saying the law. And last week, our court uh, made an official visit to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And this was following a similar visit exactly 10 years ago, in spring 2007. And the Chief Justice told me, in fact, this is incomparable in only 10 years' time. The type of subject matters you are now dealing with I had not realized that 10 years ago. And that's exactly why it matters that also the press follows our activities very closely, monitors them, reports on them. That is the judicial activity of our court. Now, as I said, we do this in interaction with the national courts in all these sensitive areas. Why is this important? It are always the national courts which identify the cases of union law, which causes them problems. They are the filter, if you want. If there is a matter of interpretation of union law, a regulation, a directive, an article from the charter or from the treaties, and they want explanations on that, they will submit a question to us. Or when <clears throat> there is an, a, an act of a union institution, a commission decision, or um, uh, directive, like in Digital Rights Island, of the Parliament and the Council, which is possibly incompatible with the higher rule of law, then you have constitutionality review, like Marbury versus Madison in the United States. So you have, in other words, um, the classical functions of a constitutional and a Supreme Court, which are fulfilled by our court, normally in interaction with national courts, submitting to us cases in all these fields. 
And it is the quality of that dialogue with the national courts, whereby national courts identify cases, submit them to us, and we are interpreting or controlling the validity of the union law rules involved, which will certi be certified back as an answer binding on the national court, not just on the national court asking the question, but on all national courts. And that is the most profound raison d'etre of this preliminary rulings mechanism, which is the, the real success story of the Court of Justice of the European Union. That is that once a particular judge coming, let's say, from Estonia, or here from Belgium, or from Greece, submits a question to us, to the Court of Justice of the European Union, all the member states will be entitled to come in the debate. The Union institutions as well all using their own language, potentially 24, right? Internally, we work in French, so it goes all to French. We make a collegiate judgment. The judgment is retranslated in all 24 languages because it will be the law of the land everywhere. And that is how union law works. Union law is domestic law in all 28 member states. In Estonia, union law is Estonian law. In Poland, it's Polish law. In Belgium, it's Belgian law. And I can so go on for all the member states. That's why it needs to be available in their language. But our intervention sees to it that the interpretation, enforcement of this union law, these union law rules and principles, is strictly uniform. And this uniformity is, in fact, another way of guaranteeing the equality of member states before union law. Because if one single directive or regulation, legislative act of the European Union, were to mean something different in France and in the Netherlands and in Portugal, you would no longer have a European Union. So the central role of our court lies there. And in very sensitive areas, asylum and immigration, fight against terrorism, the Eurozone litigations, the, um, as I said, uh, private international law litigation, international, um, international criminal law litigation, etc. Very sensitive areas. For last year, we had an average length of the proceedings, preliminary proceedings of 15 months, which is very good because the 15 months contain everything. The reference for a preliminary ruling comes in. It must first be translated to all 24 languages. It will be notified to all the governments in their language. Then they have two months and 10 days to make their observations in their language. That needs all to be translated to French. And only then is the case en état then it can be dealt with. Then the whole working go through our, through our internal workings. We make a the judge rapporteur makes a preliminary report to assess the difficulty of the case, together with the advocate general. It goes to the general meeting to the court, which is a big dispatching center meeting every Tuesday afternoon, where the judges and the advocate generals, all of them, will assess the importance of the cases in all relevant respects, and sent them to 15 judges, the Grand Chamber, which is under the personal presidency always of the president of the court, and in the permanent presence of the vice president, all the other judges rotating on a case-by-case -case basis. Then two-thirds of the cases are sent to five judges, and the remainder, the very easy cases, to three judges. We decide normally by judgment, unless the case is inadmissible, or the case law is so well established that we proceed by a reasoned order. So that's how it works. So to do all of that within an average of 15 months is enormous. It's very quick. The average length for appeals was 12.9 months, or 13 months almost, and for um, the durations overall, it was 14 and a half months about. 
The urgent preliminary reference procedure works within three months by cutting down on some stages of these proceedings. And that is very important whenever in the uh, criminal cases, but also sometimes asylum cases, um, or in the child custody cases, uh, people are either in custody or there is a particular uh, urgency as to the, the subject matter in the main action pending in the national court. Then we can uh, order the urgent preliminary procedure, and we do. I think um, that in general, I draw your attention from the book, because it's all there, to a few highlights of our case law, but I actually be very brief on that, to give you an idea in very concrete fashion. In April of last year, we decided the Aranyosi and Caldararu cases, Grand Chamber, whereby we balanced the principle of mutual recognition of judgments in criminal cases in the context of the European arrest warrant with respect for fundamental rights. In concreto, we specified in which cases a, a, a Hungarian, respectively Romanian national um, caught in Germany could not be surrendered to respectively Hungary and Romania, their country of um, origin, but that is rather sheer accident, um, where they were the first um, alleged to have committed a criminal offence and the second was even convicted of a criminal offence. But there was a limit set to the mutual recognition because um, the uh, prison conditions were so poor that there might be a problem for human dignity. That is, the risk of inhuman and degrading treatment. So there we balanced out in line with our opinion two stroke 13 on the uh, accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights. We worked out the, the main thrust of that opinion on the occasion of that reference. It was a reference for a preliminary ruling sent by the Oberlandesgericht Bremen. And you see how the European Union then works. Concerns for constitutionality in Germany, where you have the Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, overseeing what the ordinary courts do, but in a context of European Union law, and hence the Court of Appeal in Bremen referring to us in order to know what the human rights aspect under Union law is in such a case. And I must say, uh, that we fell uh, very largely in line with case law of the Bundesverfassungsgericht on that level, which is, of course, to be taken into account also by us, because we work out the fundamental rights of the European Union, as Article 6 of the Treaty on the European Union says it, in accordance with the common constitutional traditions of the member states. So that's a good example of that. Um, we, I give you only, for sake of time, one other example, it's uh, in the consumer protection uh, field. Um, it's the Gutierrez-Naranjo case. It was a reference made by a first instance court uh, in Spain. Um, and the problem was the following. There were uh, in the uh, uh, mortgage, mortgage loan contracts passed by Spanish banks with consumers who wanted to borrow money to buy uh, the, their, their house in which they were going to live, huh? so it's the housing, um, there were so-called um, floor clauses, um, clausula suelo, for those of you who speak Spanish. Huh? And it means that the interest rate on such a, a loan is variable, but it can never go under a particular floor, which is relatively high, by the way. So meaning, if the interest rates were to go up, the bank wins. But if the interest rates go down, the bank will not lose because they can go down to quasi zero like now. But I mean, they will in any event be, let's now say, 3%. And that clause was held by Spanish judges to be abusive under the European Directive of 1993. Um, which is in line with our case law, or earlier case law. So it's now this involved millions absolutely millions of Spanish households. There had been street manifestations against these clauses. 
So they were struck down on the basis of European Union law and a dialogue between our court and the national court. The problem, however, was that the Spanish Supreme Court had limited in 2013 the um, possibility to claim back from the bank what had been paid too much. They had limited it for the past. And the first instance court said that this was not in line with the directive. So you see, a Supreme Court, first instance court, because all the courts can always ask questions to us. So having heard the arguments of a whole range of member states, according to the procedure I just described, we finally came out to the point that we said that this limitation of the effects in time was not consistent, like the first instance judge suggested, was not consistent with European Union law. And so therefore now there are um, uh, mega settlements between the banks and their clients for what has been paid too much in the past. It's another example of where you see that our case law is really touching directly on the lives of the citizen. There are many more examples like internet and privacy, uh, intellectual property protection, um, and privacy on the internet, because often it's because of copyrights and pirating on the internet that some of the uh, privacy rights of the IT users uh, are being um, breached. And there we have also to make a fine balancing on the basis of, um, of the, uh, the applicable rules, including the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But maybe we can discuss that further when you are asking questions. So I hope I have given at least an introductory view of the type of institution uh, you are meeting here today. And I think now it's high time to pass the floor to my colleague, president, and friend, because we have been sitting together on the general court before I came up to the 